everybody. My name's Julia, as Alia told you. Uh, I am an improvement coach at a company called Lean Kit. It's out of Nashville, and we make visual work management software, so your Kanban boards and things like that. And I'm an improvement coach, and what that means is that I help teams take a little bit of the crazy out of their everyday work. And a lot of crazy can come from metrics. So I want to talk today about how to avoid running with sharp metrics. Basically, how to avoid causing injury to people or yourselves with some, with some less than ideal metrics. But first, a little bit about myself. I uh, started at Turner Broadcasting System as a web developer. So my background is web development. And I did that for about nine years before I decided to move into a management role. And I moved from working on sites like CNN.com, Sports Illustrated, over to managing the web dev team for NBA.com. So we had to do the league site. Turner Sports had their contract. And my team was working their ass off and not getting a lot of stuff done. And that's when I learned about Kanban and all other goodies that could help us end up becoming a team that other people actually wanted to model against. And then I moved to F5 Networks, and that brought me to Seattle, where I'm neighbors with all the Chevy people, so that's really great. But um, one of the things that I learned in my management career was that metrics can be very helpful, but they can also hurt us, and hurt us pretty badly, and we may not even know it. So if that's true, you know, why do we even bother? Why do we gather metrics? Well, a few reasons is that we might want to discover new information. We might want to answer some open questions to learn about how we're actually doing and assess our effectiveness in meeting our goals. So metrics are really important, and there's three types of business analytics that you'll see out in the wild. The first is descriptive analytics, and that's what we're most comfortable with. It's what you see really everywhere in business today. These are your, um, your incident reports, your cycle time reports, how long did it take you to get stuff done? They basically answer the question, what's already happened, right? And that's good to know we learn from history and business just like everything else. But the place that we're trying to move a lot to now is more into the predictive world of analytics. We need to find out not only what has happened, but take that and figure out what might happen. So there are all kinds of modeling, like Monte Carlo simulations and things like that, in which you can sort of predict a range of possible outcomes. And so we're not as comfortable with that. We're still trying to dip our toes into that, even though it's been around a while. So that's, that's where we are right now, trying to get there. But really, the holy grail of metrics is prescriptive analytics. This takes all the learnings from those predictions and then you pile on top of that something that can help you get to the desired outcome. So you've looked and you've said, here's all the possible outcomes. Here's the what I want. What can I do in an automated fashion or even a manual fashion to help us get to that desired outcome? So that's really the holy grail and where we want to try to go. So it doesn't matter what measurement you're making, what metric you use, the fact that you measure it and show it to other people is going to tell people that you value that thing, okay? Especially if you're in any kind of position of authority, the fact that you stop to measure something, you put your time and your effort in, and you show that to other people, someone's going to think, oh, that's important. That's what they value, so I better optimize that metric, meaning optimize the metric, meaning you do whatever it takes to make that number higher because that's, that's an important metric. So with that actually comes a lot of risk. If you're sort of irresponsibly just trying out a lot of things and not really communicating about that, you can actually be hurting yourself or your team's goals with metrics uh, because they're optimizing the things that really aren't important to you but they just don't know that yet. So what I want to ask of you uh, this is a silent ask, but I will ask you to participate a little later, so I'm just giving you a heads up, drink your coffee or something. Um, but I would love you to think of the key metrics your team uses or the things that you feel you're measured on and sort of assess them against the stuff we're talking about so that you can go back to your organizations and talk about these things to see if you can improve your metric inventory or situation. And if you want to talk later, I'd be more than happy to do that. 
The talk is basically broken down into three sections. First is gonna be anti-patterns. We like to talk about anti-patterns, right? The things that we can do wrong. Uh, engineers like to talk about doom and gloom, so we're gonna do that. But then we're gonna go back and not just leave you hanging, we're gonna talk about how to start and create a purposeful and working metrics inventory. How can we do that safely? And then I'm gonna give you an example of the metrics that I used in my last role and how that fits into the concepts that we're talking about. So we're gonna dive right into to the anti-patterns. And one of the biggest ones that we see is that people start measuring before they know why they're measuring, right? Oh, there's something out there, let's just use that, but you're not really sure why. And the way I like to think about this problem is thinking about a doctor's appointment. So you walk into a doctor's appointment, they don't immediately start giving you tests, right? They don't immediately start taking your blood, all this stuff. You stop and you have a conversation with them. You tell the nurse first why you're there, and then when the doctor comes in, they ask you again, you do a little bit of chit chat, and only then do they really understand what you're there, why they're helping you. And when they understand that goal, then they can decide which tests or which things they wanna measure. So once they do that, and once they get the answers from those measurements, then they can decide what they're going to do to help you. These are their experiments. Do you get medicine? Do you just come back in a few days? So we don't see that first step of discovery missed a lot at doctor's appointments. That would be ridiculous, right? So why do we think that's okay in business? It's really not, it's exactly the same kind of concept. So there's a necessary order of operations that we want to consider. First, define your goals, then you gather your metrics, and then you look at the results and develop a strategy to get towards your goals. So if we do those things in that order, we're less likely to have some of the following problems. But I want to address the concept of how much to measure first. And there are definitely philosophies to measure everything because you just might need it one day. But as many of you know, inventory of any kind is an overhead. There's costs associated with managing inventory. And invisible inventory is just the same. I mean, virtual inventory, virtual servers, right? The more things that we're trying to manage, metrics included, um, has a cost. And not only does it have a cost, in a, case of metrics, it might cloud the picture of what you're really trying to focus on. So we want to keep it lean and simple and to the point. Now, Alia talked about vanity metrics, and this is something that we did talk about at the DevOps Summit. And vanity metrics, by a general definition, are metrics that tell you interesting information, but they aren't actually helpful to you, okay? And you see, if you look this up on the internet, you'll see a lot of marketing examples, like uh, number of likes, number of you know, views to the page. It's not actually telling them how much conversion that they're getting from all that material that they make. It's great that you like it, but is liking it the same as getting business? So we have that a lot in technology as well. I like to call them number of metrics. If you're not in a manufacturing facility stamping out widgets, then you know the number of widgets stamped out might be a good metric. But otherwise, it might be a signal that you are looking at a vanity metric. And we're gonna talk about number of deployments, deployment frequency today as an example. But before we do that, I want people to know that the danger of vanity metrics is not in the actual metric itself. It's really how we perceive the metric, okay? So deployment frequency, for example, is telling us how many deploys we do in a time period. That's great information, right? It's useful. But if we look at that metric and we say, oh, look at how much awesome stuff or value we put out for our customers, that might be true, but we're not getting it from the deployment frequency metric. It's not telling us how much value we put out telling us how much activity we've done. So the key concept about vanity metrics and trying to avoid them is just reminding yourself to not confuse activity with progress. So that's the key point about vanity metrics. Metric itself is not bad. 
It's the value you put on the metric that might mislead you that is really the problem. Now, I put up here thinking shame will produce desired behaviors is the anti-pattern, but at a higher level, it's really measuring individuals over teams. So the shame is just the more obvious one. So I'm gonna give you an example of something that very likely happens in organizations. And I'm gonna ask you some questions that I actually want you to answer me. So um, the situation is this. Each one of you is an uh, employee in company X, and you're an engineer, and your name showed up on a dashboard of engineers who have had tickets breach their SLA, okay? Not only that, the dashboard is placed in the hallway with all the executive offices, right? So your name is showing up on a naughty list in front of the executive offices. So first question, and someone can just shout out, what's the first thought that you have when you see your name on that dashboard the first time? Exactly. <laughs> Anything else? How do I get off there as quickly as possible? Exactly. Now, second question, is there a plausible reason other than just innate incompetence that you might have breached an SLA? Okay, who wants to give me an example? Somebody else's innate incompetence. True, someone else's innate incompetence back in the back? Ask for the impossible, and I heard someone else. Unresponsive users. Unresponsive users, great. Those are all great and true examples. Also, maybe you got pulled off on an emergency. I mean, real things happen. So there are a lot of actions that you could take after you see your name on that board. Are all of them in the best interest of the company? If you get pulled off on an emergency, you could stop working on that you know, production down situation to fix your name. Uh, what else might you do that is not in the best interest of the company to preserve your self-worth or your self-interest? Close the ticket. Rush the thing. Rush the thing. Great. So we know that too many good people are called out because of a bad system design, right? The fact that your name was on that SLA breach list doesn't mean that you're a bad person or a bad developer. It means that circumstances have caused you to make a choice that has resulted in a breached SLA. And what, when we see our names on lists like these, the people that put us on those lists are forcing us to make a decision between our self-interest and the interests of the company. So why do we put people in that position? Why don't we look at the reasons why and try to fix the system problems or the team outcomes and avoid calling people out individually because when we do that, we've seen that that can have consequences that we didn't really intend. When we're putting people on lists like this, we're thinking that we're gonna get the outcome that's in our head, but rarely that's, that's the case, rarely. So moving on from that, another issue that we can have is lacking awareness of the bigger picture. And that can be a big problem. I'm gonna use some images from a book called ReZoom to sort of illustrate my point. So I'm a person who needs to operate the situation that's happening in these images. So right now I'm seeing this, this exotic looking guy standing in a jungle and there's something in the background. So I'm gonna take a step back, you know, and then I see not only is there an exotic guy sitting on an elephant with another woman and a businessman. So if I'm thinking how I need to operate the situation, I'm gonna be concerned about safety of falling off the elephant. Can they communicate? They look like they're from different cultures. Uh, is there anything blocking the way of where they need to go? Okay, so you know that's a perfectly reasonable set of concerns from my viewpoint. But if I step back, it's just a picture on a box on a boat, okay? And if I step back even farther, it's a picture on a box on a boat, it's a toy boat being played with by a kid. So now are my concerns for operating the situation gonna be the same? No, they're not, right? It's a completely different situation. So the concept here is that, yes, we need to know the details of what we're looking at, but we need to step back 
and also understand how they fit into the bigger picture. Uh, the problem if we don't do that is that we tend to over or maybe even under inflate the importance of what we're staring at in, at any given time and we're not seeing how it really fits into the context of our overall organization. And then the final anti-pattern I want to talk about is treating metrics like targets. And this is really mostly about managing by numbers. So a good example is that you might be told we need to get this application up to 95% test coverage if you're a developer. And since that's my background, I tend to like those examples. Now, if you're at 5%, that target you know, gives you a good hint that you need to move in this direction pretty quickly. So there was significant difference between 5% and 95%. But if you're up to 92, 93, 94%, is, you know, is there really significant difference from where you are to 95%? Maybe, maybe not, but we don't know without looking deeper. Now, choosing that 95% helps people know when they can stop. You know, you're not necessarily trying to get to 100%. It's not feasible. But if it requires a huge order of magnitude effort to get that last 1%, is it really worth it? And again, we don't know. We have to do an assessment and understand but if we're managing by that number and focused on the number, people are more than likely going to do whatever it takes to get there without understanding the consequences. So Dr. W. Edwards Deming is a famous management person. And he says that if you give a manager a target, he'll hit it no matter what the consequences to the organization are. And that's really the point that I'm trying to make. Woo! <laughs> So, and it's, even though he said, manager, this is really anyone, right? If you're told this number is the most important thing, we forget why we're reaching the number, and we don't know how to make decisions around whether or not we should keep striving for that number. So it's all well and good to know what we can do wrong, but it's more important to know how we can do it right. So there's a, there's a way that we can ensure the safety of our metrics inventory at a much higher level. And we're gonna start with the most obvious. Know your goal. Why are you trying to measure anything? What are you trying to achieve? A measurement without a goal is a distraction. Now once you have a goal, you can do this model called GQM, Goals, Questions, Metrics, to help you map metrics back to your underlying goal. So first you, cl you clearly set your goal, you make sure you understand it, and then you work to figure out which questions, if answered, will tell me if I'm meeting my goal. Once you have an understanding of those questions, you can do one step deeper. Which metrics, if gathered, will answer the question? And we already know if we answer those questions, we'll know if we're meeting our goal or not. So this is one method which you can map metrics to goals. If you don't have a way to do that, this framework is a really good idea. Now, we don't want to just do this ourselves. We don't want to be a manager or one person in an ivory tower doing this. We want the people who are very close to what's happening, we want them to help us understand all of the variations or the situations that we might need to consider. So don't do it one person in a room and get a narrow viewpoint. Make this a team exercise. Now, if we've done that GQM mapping, this should be sort of a pass-through. But in general, make sure any metric that you use passes a so what test. And that so what test is that it either matters to my customer or it's something that's going to help me make a decision or take an action. If it can't do either one of those things, then you know, we're left wondering why we're measuring it. <coughs> Every metric that we use has a potential for good and evil, right? It doesn't matter what it is, every single one has two sides. So now, since we've mapped our goals, our metrics to our goals, we should have an idea of what we want to get out of the metric. We understand that side pretty well. But now we have to find out how we could hurt ourselves by gathering that metric, because we've already talked about things can have unintended consequences. 
So we're going to use the deployment frequency exercise, and I'm going to ask you for some feedback again. So if our core belief is that we believe that measuring deployment frequency can tell us about the health of our deploy pipeline or process. And we think that if we deploy less often, it's likely because it's harder to do and therefore is a less healthy process. And if we deploy more often, it must be an easier process, which means it's healthier. But if we take that deploy metric too far, that deploy frequency, and all we're focusing on is just trying to get more and more deploys in less and less time, how could we hurt ourselves? What could we do that's sort of a bad decision to optimize that metric? Why don't you take some time, think about yourself, or talk to your neighbor, and I want to hear an example of some bad things that we could do to game this metric. Go. I'm good with silence. If you already have one, you can just holler it out. Yep. Yeah. If you know the answers you want, you can definitely go find the data that tells you it. Yes, in the back? Okay, that you, the questions are asked and you get the answers that you want. That's a really good point. Hold on to, I think that's very similar. Hold on to that. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Okay, yep, in the back. Yeah, you may like quality slip so you can show a higher frequency level. Um, I can take one more. Anybody else have one? Yep. Yeah, you can push out things that have no value. Um, another, when I did this at my company last week for training, somebody said, well, if we're having a really good deploy week, we might hold something back just in case next week sucks. Right? You know, there's all kinds of ways to sort of game things. But the point is, is that any metric is going to have some things that we could call out. It's important that we know what they are because every metric has a ratio, a risk-reward ratio. And we need to make sure that's not upside down. <clears throat> when you do this, again, involve your team to get a wider perspective. Engineers, developers, other people are usually fine with embracing their inner cynic. So asking the team to participate in the exercises isn't just fun, it gives you a well-rounded idea of how you could hurt yourself with the metric. And it sounds like something that's easy to throw away and just dismiss, but this is a really good learning opportunity to find out things that you may not be thinking about for these metrics. And again, the goal is to see if your risk-reward ratio is positive or negative so that you can make an informed decision about whether or not to use that metric. Also, any metric that you use, and I'm going to use deploy frequency again, may be good when you have a huge problem in your deploy pipeline, but once you get over that hurdle and you're sort of churning you know, out stuff pretty easily, that metric may be more likely to turn into a target situation. So we need to understand why we use our metric, and then we need to reflect back on a regular cadence to understand if these are still helping us, right? <clears throat> when we overcome the major barriers that cause us to gather that in the first place, we may want to replace that with something else. So if it doesn't still pass the so what test, if it's no longer driving change or helping you make decisions, then it's like expired food. Discard it, do something else. Because hanging on to metrics that don't help us anymore will cause some of those negative problems that we talked about earlier. The final sort of piece to having a good metrics inventory speaks to what some of the gentlemen said before about finding metrics that tell you what you want. And Larry Maccheroni, who's a data scientist, um, in the Agile space came up with this balance quadrant idea. And this is a good framework for you if you're starting from scratch with this concept. 
Essentially, we want to make sure our business isn't like a wobbly table where you're really good over here and you're sort of bad over there, right? And if we look at all of our metrics individually without balance across all of our capabilities, then we're a bit wobbly. Nobody wants to sit at a wobbly table. Nobody wants to be a customer of a wobbly, inconsistent business. So if we look at metrics in sort of a balance, I'll give this example here, do it fast. Are we keeping pace with our business? Do it right. Are people happy with the work that we do, especially when we're doing it fast? Do it on time. When we promise, can we deliver on those promises? And then this fourth part is very important. Can we do all of those things at the same time, but then can we keep doing it over and over and over? So the whole is greater than the sum of any one of those quadrants, right? Coaching comes in when you want to make a change in one of these areas, like do it fast. You want to get faster, but you don't want to kill do it right or do it on time. So don't be afraid to make metrics trade-offs in order to maintain a balanced quadrant. So if you're really, really good at delivering quickly, but your quality sort of suffering, it's okay to sacrifice a little speed to bring the quality up and have a more balanced scale. <clears throat> now, an example that I've used in the past um, is going to be shown here, but I do want to tell you that I didn't know about this bal balance quadrant when I gathered these metrics. So I'm just sort of lucky that it actually worked out okay. <laughs> But, um, so I was a manager at F5, the IT web development teams, F5 networks. You may use their load balancers and all that jazz. But um, each quarter, we had to give quarterly business reviews. And so I had to go up to the executive teams and share metrics that showed how successful our team was. So this is how my QBR sort of broke apart. Do it fast. Well, I looked at open versus closed trends of the work we're doing. Are we keeping pace? finishing stuff with the rate that stuff was coming in. Cycle time trends, how long is it taking to complete our work over time? Are we getting better, slower, staying the same? Do it right. My team had 60 web apps. Now, they might have been tiny PHP apps and major Java apps. But we had a lot of applications, and I needed to know which ones had the most incident levels in a particular quarter so I could see that over time and learn where we want to spend our time. Then we had customer satisfaction, not only from when you close a ticket, you get sort of the automated survey that most people never fill out, but also every, on a cadence, we would go out and query our customers and say how we're doing, you know, and then gather that over time. We wanted to make sure that we were doing the things that they want in a way that made them happy. Do it on time. We did have SLAs for some of our work. Not all of it. So we looked at percentage of SLA breaches over time for the quarter and trend, as well as looking at the project progress. Uh, we had operations, daily operations work, as well as project long-term enhancement, all of that. So we needed to make sure not only could we manage the SLAs for the day-to-day -day work, but that we were hitting schedules on the longer-term work as well. And then keep doing it. We did quarter over quarter trends for all of those metrics, and we visualized that in our QBR because it's great to have a great quarter, but you know, if things are going down, that's a completely different picture. So, and then not only that, when someone asks me how to define success, how do you know if your team is successful? That's a really hard question to just tell someone the answer to. But what I think is that if you can make your customers happy, at the same time you can allow your team to be happy, then you're doing something right, right? If everybody's happy, it almost doesn't matter what all the other numbers are. So just like Adam said, team happiness is a really important thing. Unhappy teams do not make great products. So that's my real world example of balance metrics. As I just alluded to, no one can give you a prescription for your metrics without understanding your situation. If you went to the doctor's office, you wouldn't just take a, a prescription without having a conversation of why you're there. And as much as I know people want to be told, here's the metrics that you can use to get success, 
It's just not a feasible question to ask someone who doesn't understand your context. Every set of metrics needs to be unique to the problems that you're experiencing. Now, there are some metrics that you may decide to use all the time everywhere you go, some underlying baseline information. I use cycle time. I like, you know, Kanban is a thing that I, I ascribe to a lot. So cycle time, lead time, flow metrics are something that I sort of always bring along. Just like at the doctor's office, they always take your blood pressure, take your temperature, all of that. It's okay to have that subset. But when you look at your full metrics inventory, you have to come to your own conclusions based on your own context. So the takeaways that I wanted to give are reminders of the right ways to do things. And I think that if you do these things, you're going to be in a very good situation to run around with safe metrics. So first is do something like a GQM. Make sure your metrics are mapping to your goals. Understand the risk profile for each thing you want to measure so that you don't get caught unawares. Get rid of things that aren't helping you anymore. Yeah, maybe they were great two months ago and you solved that problem. It doesn't mean it's going to be helpful forever. Don't be afraid to throw away metrics. And then make sure that that inventory balances out each other so that you can ensure your whole team or whole company is successful and not just pockets of success that uh, could cause issues in areas you're not monitoring. And then finally, just don't pick up and take someone else's prescription because that's a no-no, that's bad, you could get hurt. So I do have these slides uploaded so you can download them if you want. If you want. And not only can you can continue the conversation here with your peers, with me, with anyone else, but you can also continue it on Twitter with me at Everyday Kanban or on my blog of the same name. So I think that I have a few minutes, and I wanted to see if there's any questions out there, or any comments even, about metrics, any questions or thoughts about your metrics and how they relate to this stuff. Yeah, I think, yeah, so he asked how, essentially is there, how could you show that there's value in qualitative over quantitative metrics? And while it's comforting, everyone feels like it must be quantitative to be scientific, right? That and only scientific quantitative measurements are important. But as I talked about with uh, how, how can you measure success, the two things that I talked about, team happiness and customer happiness, are completely subjective. And I think subjective information can tell us a lot if we're tracking that. And if we're looking at that in conjunction with some other quantitative metrics, I think they can add significant value. Definitely don't just throw something away because it's not a number-based quantitative metric. Yeah. yeah, so if I understand, it, it's more of a comment that um, a lot of times you'll see a rate your pain scale, right? And when you're changing sort of how sad or happy you are, people don't realize that they're actually changing a number because behind those faces is a quantitative number. So that's true. So it's a good example that you can turn the, qual the qualitative into quantitative with some, some methods like that, for sure. OK, we have a couple more minutes. If there's any other comments or questions. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate it and hope that helps.